1987's Hellraiser was the groundbreaking adaption of Clive Barker's novella The Hellbound Heart, a book that opened up audiences worldwide to the pleasures of the Cenobites, Clive Barker's demonic assortment of grotesque torturers. Looking under the surface, however, it's clear to see that Barker intended much more than just a new set of faces for the growing slew of 80s slasher icons. He wished to redefine what the slasher genre could be. Explorers in the further regions of experience, demons to some, angels to others. Barker's intention with Hellraiser was to create something that would give his audience pause for thought, to blur the lines between pleasure and pain, right and wrong, heaven and hell. The monsters in his film are controlled and elegant in their work. They see suffering as a pleasure and reward those plucky enough to unlock their puzzle box the lament configuration, with the gift of eternal pleasure through maximum torment. <laughs> Barker's vision was an undoubted success. Hellraiser is about as stylish as horror movies came, supposedly drawing from punk fashion, Catholicism, and various New York and Amsterdam S&M clubs. Prior to his writing, Barker co-founded his own theatre company named The Dog Company, of whom Doug Bradley, who would go on to play Pinhead in the Hellraiser franchise, was a member. Someone whose cultural history is steeped in the arts to the extent of Barker was bound to create a film with depth beyond its initial experience, and it shows. Hellraiser is an instrumental addition to the genre of domestic horror, and rife with homosexual subtext, Barker himself being openly gay for his entire career. What's the matter? There's no time! No way, no way. I told you all that's over with now. No, it's not! We've got to get out of here! No, stay with us. We can all be happy here. Domestic horror has become much more prominent in the genre through modern times, and the most successful franchises in recent memory have garnered much of said success from it. When we refer to domestic horror, we refer to the invasion of normality that you come to expect from the idea of home, family, safety, familiarity. Well, this is it. The old homestead. The reason domestic horror is so effective with audiences is that it sticks with them. If someone's house can become inhabited by an evil force, could it happen to me? It's the reason why nobody wanted to leave a foot out of the bed after seeing paranormal activity, nor venture into the attic for fear that Insidious's red-faced demon would snatch them away. What? He's here! While the film does introduce monsters into a relatable setting, Hellraiser takes this a step further than most, and ensures that the horror of its universe, the Cenobites, the suffering, and the murders of multiple men, are direct consequences of the human character's actions and intentions. Julia, through having an affair with Frank on her wedding day, sets in motion the remainder of the film. Had she not caved to Frank's advances, she would have no reason to help him return to the mortal world, and nobody else would have suffered as a consequence. Even at its core, Julia's cheating on her husband Larry is a fear itself. The fear of infidelity and its breaking down of the family structure. I don't know. It's way beyond me. Kirsty is at first attempting to save her father from Julia's adulterous nature, but then winds up trying to save her father's life, both of which threaten her concept of normality. We see Julia's transformation from unfaithful wife to murderer, both literally and through the eyes of Kirsty. In a sense, Julia becomes the real monster of the film, and it was rare for a slasher film to make its human characters as inhuman and immoral as its physical monsters. Hi. Are you alright? Kirsty? I thought I'd lost you. No, I'm here.
Throughout Hellraiser, Clive Barker and cinematographer Robin Vigian use lighting to represent a character's morals. This can be as simple as less light says they're a worse person, and more light says they have good intentions. You can see it early on in the film, where the house is bright and smoothly lit, even in the attic which turns into the darkest epicentre of the house. Once Frank starts to return, the lighting tells a very different story. The home is brought into darkness almost entirely, especially locations that were well lit during the day before, that have now lost that even glow. A perfect example of light telling morals is in this sequence, where the four main human characters are shown in quick succession. Frank is barely visible, whilst Julia has been brought into the shadows, signalling her gradual moral descent. Larry is lit, but still kept in the dark, both literally and in regards to Julia's activities, while Kirsty sits in an even light, despite it being the middle of the night. Another interesting aspect to this idea is when it comes to the Cenobites. When Pinhead is first revealed to Kirsty, he is basked in a glow of light. But as Doug Bradley begins to speak, the light gently rolls on and off him, reinforcing the Cenobites' combination of extremes. By the end of the film, when Frank is back in hell, Julia is dead and all the evil is vanquished, the house literally glows from the inside, showing us that balance has been restored to the setting, as it was at the start when the family moved in. Children who need to be taught to respect traditional moral values are being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. When Clive Barker was both writing and filming Hellraiser, Margaret Thatcher's government passed the controversial Section 28 Amendment, which placed severe censorship on LGBT education and culture in Britain. I believe that Clive was perhaps influenced by this law, this push for self-oppression, and it seeded its way into the writing of The Hellbound Heart and subsequently Hellraiser. While the character in question, Frank, is by no means a positive LGBT figure, to ignore the glaring complexity of his character would be a disservice to the tones and themes that Hellraiser tackles. In an interview with The Advocate, Barker stated that despite his frequent inclusion of gay and lesbian characters in his books, he's had little success trying to put positive gay characters into the world of horror films. When you break down the character of Frank, you can find plenty of interpretations of that notion of a man who is struggling with his sexuality. Frank, desperate to feel true pleasure through sexual gratification, ends up in possession of the Lament configuration and solves it, allowing him to enter the world of the Cenobites, and in doing so, it could be interpreted that he makes a self-discovery of who he is. From here, Frank's journey is one of frequent self-doubt. He escapes from hell, literally fleeing from his understanding of himself. He's obviously made one of his famous getaways. To find that he has returned to the human world, a world that regards him to be a monster as an empty skeleton. He then, through the assistance of Julia, who remains infatuated with him, claims that he needs men to become whole again. He feeds on their life force by penetrating their flesh with his fingers, about as sexual as H.R. Geiger's xenomorph, and absorbs their life force, slowly taking on his original form. There is still an uncertainty in himself, however, as he literally dons the skin of Larry, a straight married man, perhaps in order to cling to this idea of a societal norm, a last-ditch effort to reject the monster that he considers himself to be. Of course, there's the chance that this is simply a read too far, though Clive himself stated that he was rewriting the genre to focus on its potential to dramatise and evoke social, psychological change, and considering his own lifestyle and the sociological conditions of the time, it wouldn't seem out of place for him to address the issue of internalised homophobia and gay oppression. Overall, Hellraiser has made a unique impact on the horror genre, not only through its filmmaking techniques, but also through its story's content, and even its subtext. While other horror films at the time had ugly villains chasing vapid characters, Hellraiser was brewing an evil that spoke more about humanity than the supernatural.